Look what crossed my desk. It's a Mead 8-inch F4 Schmidt Newtonian from about 2003. You don't see very many Schmidt Newtonians these days, so is this a design that they should bring back, or is it a design that deserved to die off? Let's see if we can find out. So on any fast Newtonian, the problem is there is a lot of aberrations near the edge of the field in terms of coma and astigmatism. One way to correct for this is to put a Schmidt corrector plate on the front of the Newtonian. So a Schmidt Newtonian is just like a regular Newtonian, except it has a Schmidt corrector plate on the front, sort of like a Schmidt Cassegrain. Here's the only thing that distinguishes a Schmidt Newtonian from a conventional Newtonian. There's a plate on the front. Now, according to Telescope Optics, I happen to love this book, by the way, a Schmidt Newtonian does not perfectly correct for coma and astigmatism. However, in theory, it should be better than a conventional Newtonian with the coma reduced by about 40%. So if you look at the page here, the top one third is the spot diagram for a conventional Newtonian, and the middle third of the page is what happens when you add the corrector plate. So according to the authors, the coma should be reduced by about 40%. So there have been Schmidt Newtonians on the market, and they tend to come and go. They don't tend to stay very long. I remember in the 1980s, Celestron used them for their Comet series, and then Meade made a couple of runs at this with a fork-mounted system, and then later, starting around the year 2000, you started to see these Schmidt Newtonians on LXD 55 mounts. And here we are indoors with the scope mounted on the supplied Mead LXD 55 mount. Now this mount they used with several different telescopes. There were 6-inch, 8-inch, and 10-inch Schmidt Newtonians, 5-inch and 6-inch achromatic refractors, and an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. This one weighing in at 23.5 pounds, as you see, getting into my discomfort zone for a mid-size mount. I think for me, if I were to use this thing seriously, I'd want to see it on something a little bit heavier, perhaps something in the Atlas class. So this particular LXD55 mount does have a minor mechanical issue. And right after filming this, I'm going to take the tube off and send the mount off to a club member to see if he can fix it. And I'll do the rest of my test on one of my other mid-size mounts. Hello, and we're back. It's about two weeks later, and what an interesting two weeks it's been for this telescope, at least. You know, I remember when these things first came out. The LXD55 was the first, one of the first anyway, mass-produced, moderately priced go-to mounts, and people were buying these things just to get the mount. They would sell off the optical tube and just keep the mount. Some club members were recipients of these optical tubes, and since the LXD55 has not been particularly well known as a reliable mount, some of these club members thought they came out with the better of the deal. So let's take a look at the optical tube and see what we find. Now, I played with this thing several nights um, over the past two weeks, and I'll give you the bad news first. Um, the focuser. It's, it's just not good. Uh, there's an enormous amount of play in this thing. Um, I tried adjusting the screws. There aren't very many of them. I tried shimming it. Uh, it's, just, it's just not good. Uh, there's so much play in it that if I put this ASI 120 in the draw tube, uh, the mere act of trying to focus in and out on Jupiter or Saturn would result in the planet going completely out of the field of view and then back into the field of view and then out again and it was just a terrible exercise in frustration. I did manage to get a few captures but it was not easy. Second thing about the focuser is it does use this proprietary thread on cap here. Um, I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, nothing else fits it. Uh, there's two, there's an inch and a quarter, and there's a two inch. The two inch piece has gone missing. We can't find it, so you can't use two inch anything in this focuser. And in fact, if you lose this piece, you can't use inch and a quarter accessories either. Now, I have been told by some people that there are some Japanese suppliers, uh, Vixen and perhaps Takahashi, who make a very similar piece that will thread on here. Now, I don't doubt that that's true. I looked through my box of Takahashi parts, and I, if it does exist, I don't have that part. Now, 
If you're going to keep this thing long term, you might want to consider just replacing the focuser altogether. Just keep in mind that the Schmidt corrector plate is, assembly is probably going to have to come off for you to do some drilling and tapping. Just be aware of what you're getting yourself into. So how are the optics? Well, I've had the opportunity to see several of these over the years. I've never had one for this length of time. Most of them have been brief peaks, but my impression of all of these so far has been fairly consistent. Mixed. Uh, they're okay at low power, put some magnification on it, and the views start getting a little soft. This is certainly the case here at low power with 24 millimeter and 19 millimeter pan optics. It was pretty good, I thought. Um, and I also had some generic 25 millimeter plossels I used. Those were okay as well. But start pumping up the power on Jupiter and Saturn, and I actually thought this one was maybe a little bit worse than the others that I've seen. Now, upon further inspection, it was discovered that the secondary mirror assembly was just a little bit loose. Uh, you almost couldn't see it, but from one side of the sky to the other, you could imperceptibly see that it would change position a little bit. Now, at f4, it doesn't take very much um, for the collimation to go out. And also at f4, the secondary assembly is rather large, uh, and so it carries a lot of mass. And this thing is about 15 years old now. Who knows? You know where it's been or what it's been up to. So to get at the collimation screws, the ones in the back for the mirror are fine, they're easy. Uh, the, the secondary collimation screws are protected by this decorative cover and just so you know that cover pries off, it does not unscrew. Uh, once you take that off it can be quite stubborn. I would suggest just leaving it off altogether. And there was a club member who agreed to try to get this thing back into tip-top shape. And what he did was he just wound up disassembling this entire tube and putting it all together again, starting from scratch. He figured it would be easier than trying to just find some little tweak that was wrong. And it turned out to be a good thing too. So, after the readjustment, how was it? Well, what a difference. This thing is, I think, really good. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to say that. Uh, at low power, stars are sharp all the way out to the edge. It's a sign that the corrector plate is doing its job. And I was able to put 135, 150 or so power on Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, that's all the atmospheric conditions would allow. I'm pretty sure if we had better conditions, I could go higher, probably, I'm guessing, to 200 power. So that's very, very good for a fast Newtonian. On deep sky, the views are rich and contrasty. I looked at all of the summer objects, you know, the ring, the dumbbell, and M13, and M3, and F15, and all of these others, and uh, I kind of just forgot about the telescope altogether and just started enjoying myself. I like this telescope. So what about imaging? Well, I managed to take some shots before and after, and we'll throw these up now, and you can see the difference that collimation makes on both Jupiter and Saturn. I mean, wow, it's night and day. Um, this is with the ASI 120 MC, and I'll throw the boring technical details in the description below. So what about deep sky imaging? Well, when I take deep sky images with a DSLR, I normally use this. This is my Hutech modified Canon 5D Mark III. But since we don't have the 2-inch adapter for this telescope, I couldn't use this camera. But I do have a Canon T3i, also modified, and with the inch and a quarter adapter on it, it will not vignette. Now keep in mind, again, I'm fighting the focuser. Um, I would focus what I thought was the best point of focus. I let go of the focuser and the camera would flop to one side or the other, depending on the orientation of the tube. That was frustrating. Um, so I was expecting to tell you that because I was using the T3i instead of the 5D, that the images wouldn't be any good. I was expecting to tell you that because of the focuser flop and my frustrations with it, that it wasn't very good. Astrophotography is very demanding on optics, and I was also expecting because of that that I would tell you these images would not be any good. And of course, I would be wrong on all of those counts. I was really happy and pleasantly surprised with the quality of these images, and let's take a look at some of these that I took over the past week.
So some final thoughts here. The state of the collimation, and I really have to give a shout out to the members of the New Hampshire Astronomical Society. They did some amazing work on both the opti optical tube and the mount. Um, if I look good here, it's because of them. Uh, these are behind the scenes people. You don't hear about them. They don't want to see the spotlight, but uh, you know who you are out there. So again, my experience here has led me to maybe question some of my evaluations on some of the other Schmidt Newtonians from this series that I have seen. Um, maybe all they needed was some touch-up in collimation. So I am curious if you have one of these things, was your experience similar to mine or was it different? And if your experience was different, was it better or worse than the experience that I had? Now, if it's a fast imaging Newtonian that you're after, keep in mind that there are several uh, models out there that are F4, that are pure Newtonians, and they're sold by people like Astrotech and Orion and GSO and TPO, and my apologies if I've left out your favorite. But I had the 6-inch F4, the 8-inch F4, and the 10-inch F4. And at one time, there was even a 12-inch F4 that was at Astrotech. In fact, I saw one of those at NEEF one year. Uh, that's the trade show in New York. And it had a dented tube. And they were selling the thing for next to nothing. And I kept walking by it. And I kept walking by it. And when it came time for me to decide I wanted it, I came back. And it was gone from the booth. Somebody had, had ordered it. But, Anyhow, the ones I've, I've had were from Astrotech and from Orion. Uh, the modern way of dealing with edge apparitions seems to be to not use the Schmidt corrector plate, but to use a coma corrector at the eyepiece. Seems like a little bit more of an elegant solution because you can take it out if you don't want it. So the only real complaint I have left on this telescope is the focuser. Um, I think if I were to keep this telescope, I would replace it. Um, note that uh, I have seen some similar issues with other Mead focusers of this era uh, that have this sort of blue steel finish on them. So be aware of that and check that out if you're going to buy one of these telescopes personally, if you can. Many of these were sourced from places like Taiwan and China. Uh, this is an early model uh, from China. So there you have it. Bit of a story with this one, wasn't there? two weeks worth of tweaking, and it's in tip-top shape. Now, you may be wondering, what's going to happen to this guy? Well, it was donated to me, and I'm getting ready to donate it to its forever home very shortly here. In fact, it's going to the home of a New Hampshire state representative. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure it was in good shape before it left here. I don't need the government upset with me, no sir. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.